It's really my pleasure to be introducing Professor Jay Turner this morning. Um, Professor Turner has taught in the Environmental Studies program at Wellesley College since the fall of 2006. Um, his training is in environmental history and environmental issues, um, and he's also been very active in college sustainability initiatives, um, especially those pertaining to energy and climate change. Um, he has a couple of books, one of which being The Republican Reversal, Conservatives and the Environment from Nixon to Trump, um, as well as The Promise of Wilderness, American Environmental Politics Since 1964. Um, both of those look like excellent reads for all people interested in the climate. Um, when he began teaching at Wellesley, um, Jay began teaching in the ES program and teaches an introductory course focusing on issues and concepts important to environmental studies organized around climate change. He also teaches a 200 level course on US environmental history that considers the dynamic relationship between the environment and human history from civil war to present and teaches two 300 level seminars on the US environmental politics um, which examines the laws, stakeholders and political policy processes important to the federal environmental regulatory state through a series of contemporary cases studies, um, as well as a course on um, a capstone course on public writing and the environment. Um, at Wellesley, he has enjoyed working with students on research projects pertaining to public lands politics, international nature protection, and public attention to climate change. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Professor Jay Turner. Thanks, Grace. Good morning. Nice, nice to see you all. Grace, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's exciting to be at Albright, I really. We've done this a couple of times and really enjoy the opportunity. So, I put a little quiz up there. If we stabilize annual global greenhouse gas emissions at current levels, never allowing emissions to rise in the future, would we be able to keep the global climate at two degrees Celsius? In the back. Um, no. I mean, of course, if you mean two degrees Celsius compared to the 1960s, and if we take climate sensitivity around like 3, 3.2, we're going to probably reach uh, 2.8 to 3 degrees Celsius by 2100, only considering CO2 emissions. Now. Even if we stabilize emissions at exactly where we are? Yeah, so it's just going to be probably 3 degrees Celsius. Do you say no? No. You hope yes, right? Because I mean, that's a pretty big ask, right? To level off all greenhouse gas emissions immediately. Anybody else? Thoughts on this? Well, you're leaning in the right direction here. I would like to be helpful too. Yeah, hopeful too. I don't know much about environmental studies, but I think the level that we're at now, if we keep emitting greenhouse gases, we're going to have to stabilize the emissions because we're going to have yeah, okay, that's nicely put. So the real challenge here, right, isn't just uh, the status quo, it's really to make big change going forward. And we'll talk about the magnitude of those changes today. So here's the title for my talk, Climate Disorder, Global Warming in the Trump Era, or in the Era of Trump. And my plan for today is to actually only talk for a little while, maybe a half an hour or so, just kind of orienting you all to some of the basics around climate change and some of the issues that are important to be thinking about, issues that I think a lot of you all are probably already thinking about. I know some of you all know this like the back of your hand. Nice to see a couple of ES-102 alums here, some familiar faces, but lots of new faces too. Um, but so I'm gonna go through these four topics right off the top, and then there's a handout that I've sent around, and I'd encourage you all to Look at this handout as I'm talking. Think about the different slides, which topics are of most interest to you. I'll give you all a couple of minutes to chat about them in uh, small groups around the room, um, kind of midway through. And then we'll take the second half of our time together to talk about the topics that you all are most interested in. So we can just kind of jump around and see what we cover and what we don't and what you all um, think is most important. So that's the game plan for the next hour and uh, 10 minutes or so. So getting started, climate science basics. So I think we have all heard a lot about how strong the scientific consensus around climate change is. And so just to emphasize this point briefly, 
the scientific consensus is strong and it has been strong for a long time, right? So if you go to any one of the major scientific organizations and you look at what their statements are on climate change, they affirm that the scientific evidence is clear, right? The American Association for the Advancement of Science or that it's a potentially very serious problem. That was in 2004 from the American Chemical Society. The American Geophysical Union says it requires urgent action and then the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that it's, you know, the warming on the climates of the climate system is unequivocal, right? So across the board, major scientific groups, they affirm the urgency of addressing this issue and the strength of the scientific consensus. Every time we brought this topic before the whole Wellesley faculty, greater than 90% have voted in favor of taking action on climate change with the other folks um, either abstaining or uh, abstaining from, from the vote. So, you know, both at Wellesley and in the community of scientists as a whole, this is a strong consensus. So just to focus on what that means in practice. The overarching body that's responsible for assembling climate, kind of the state of climate knowledge and communicating it to the public is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And in 2018, they released their most recent kind of overarching report, which was focused on the goal of keeping climate change not at two degrees Celsius, but 1.5 degrees Celsius. And one big point they led with is that we've already seen the climate changing, right? Just affirming something that we're witnessing around us all the time. But based on the science, human activities are estimated to have caused approximately one degree Celsius of warming, right? 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit of warming from a baseline of 1950 to 1980. And global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius in a matter of decades as we look out into the future. And they have high confidence in this assessment, right? So that's one important point. The other important point is, and this comes back to that pre-quiz, right? What is it gonna take to hold climate change to a level that is manageable? And in their models, if we wanna avoid overshooting 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, global net anthropogenic CO2 emissions must decline by 45% from 2010 levels by 2030, right? So we're not talking about the status quo. We're, we're not talking about keeping things steady from here on out and emitting at the same levels that we, we're, we've been doing. We're talking about a change that looks like this when you graph it. Right, where you go from having somewhere in the neighborhood of 42 billion metric tons of CO2 being added to the atmosphere every year right now to having net zero additions when we get to 2050. So we're talking about really big changes. And so that's for 1.5 degrees C. The last couple of sentences are there. If we go to two degrees Celsius, which is kind of the the upper limit for what we would want, you know, might be able to, to manage uh, on this planet. And there, you need to decline by 25% by 2030 and reach net zero 20 years later in 2070. So this is what the IPCC is reporting back to us about the state of climate science. So it's worth asking, you know, how is it? And I think if you're in conversation with people who are uncertain about whether we need to take action on climate change, and one of the questions that comes up is, well, how do we know this? Like, how do we have so much confidence that we have a problem here that we're responsible for that we need to address? So let's talk a little bit about why scientists are so confident that this is a problem that we've caused and we need to take action on. And so, you know, one way to answer that question is to do what I just did, which is say, well, all these big scientific bodies, right, this is what they say, right? But another way to approach this is to think about ways of knowing, ways of generating knowledge, right? So let's focus on that for a couple of minutes. Because this isn't a body of knowledge that just rests on one piece of evidence or one model, right? There are a whole bunch of different ways of knowing that feed into this. So let me just take a couple of minutes and talk through each of these. So scientists, right? Inductive reasoning is important, right? We're talking about inductive reasoning. We're talking about collecting 
evidence, right? Evidence over time and then generalizing from individual observations, right? And one data set that we've already talked about is just a data set of global temperatures, right? When you take the average of all of the um, temperature monitors over time on the planet, what scientists see is that gradual increase in the average global temperature since the 19th century. And, you know, as we were just discussing, you know, when you look at that relative to the baseline, we've seen about one degree Celsius of warming already with a little bit of fuzziness, 0.8 to 1.2 degrees Celsius, right? So, you know, generalizing from this evidence, right, you start to think, well, you know, the climate is in fact warming, right? But there are lots of other data sets that we're drawing on to reach the conclusion that people are driving this. And a key one is the record of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right? So this is a data set that's called the Keeling Curve. And what it is is the longest running record of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we first started collecting this data straight out of the atmosphere from air samples in 1956. And as you can see at that time, there was about 320 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. But gradually, and you can see the wiggles with the seasons, but gradually each year, the amount of CO2 that's accumulated in the atmosphere has grown because of the activities, uh, burning fossil fuels and deforestation and other activities to the point that now we're at you know, roughly 420 parts per million CO2. Right, so one way that scientists are confident about how we're changing the climate are these kinds of long-term data sets where we can generalize from them. But another key piece of evidence, or not evidence, but way of thinking of generating knowledge is deductive reasoning. Right? Even before we started collecting data on temperature change, before we started collecting data on how greenhouse gas emissions were changing, scientists were generating hypotheses based on how they understood molecules to behave in the atmosphere. And in the 19th century, and this is how the usual story goes, John Tyndall, a British scientist, 1859, first hypothesized that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas, that it would absorb and re-radiate infrared radiation back to the planet and warm things. And, and so this is just based on kind of first principles, understanding the mechanics of how molecules work and how they interact with radiation, scientists generated this hypothesis, right? Now, since the last time I gave this talk, there's been a whole lot of interesting work in the history of science, and a historian discovered that we're wrong. It actually wasn't John Tyndall who first came up with this idea. We need to revise the story, because a woman was the one, an early American scientist, Eunice Foote, in 1856, had a, ran a series of experiments and published a paper that she was not allowed to read before the American Academy of Sciences. A, a man who was a member read this paper for her, but what the paper did was lay out the basic theory of greenhouse gases, their role in the earth climate system, and she specifically said, if there are more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, if there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, we should expect the temperature of the planet to rise. So Eunice Foote, not John Tyndall, deserves credit for being the person to have made this discovery and really highlights the impor importance of early women scientists. She was also, I think, the fifth signatory at Seneca Falls um, as well. So she was a social activist as well. So a good role model to highlight. Um, so deductive reasoning is important. Another way in which we probed and tested kind of knowledge of climate <coughs> science is through falsification, right? Scientists are inherently a really skeptical <coughs> bunch, right? They're always probing, trying to poke holes, find things that don't fit, and to test theories. And there have been questions, right? Could it just be the sun, right? Could changes in the sun be driving this increase in temperature on Earth? Is it that there's something wrong with the way we built our models, right? Could that be the problem? Or, you know, if you look over the history of science, there are times at which scientists have been, have been wrong. They have thought you know, back in the 1960s that the problem wasn't global warming, but actually an imminent ice age, right? And so there have been efforts to falsify the scientific consensus, to prove it wrong. And all of the efforts to do that have also fallen flat. 
So that's another way in which scientists have tested this, this theory. So one more, more, one more way of generating knowledge here, which is consilience which I think an uh, easy way to describe it or think of it is that it's the coming together of multiple independent lines of evidence. It's kind of like building a legal case where you look for patterns and how things fit together. And if you're a climate scientist and you start looking at data records from around the planet in different systems, what you start to see is if you're right, looking at sea levels, right? Sea level rise has been increasing. When you look at the surface temperatures of large lakes, what's the largest lake? in the world in terms of volume of water? Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal, right? So this is data that Marianne Moore and Wellesley students helped collect at Lake Baikal, and it shows the temperature of the surface of Lake Baikal increasing over time, right? You look at what birds are doing and how their behavior is changing. Birds are staying further north because the climate is warmer. Or if you look in the Arctic, plants are flowering earlier, right? And so if you're a, a lawyer, if you're someone who's trying to fit the pieces together, right, all of these pieces of evidence point in the same general direction, right? You can see that Arctic sea ice has been forming uh, less, that oceans have becoming more acidic because of increased carbon that's been, carbon dioxide that's been absorbed into them. And just the content of heat that's in the ocean has been increasing as well. And so a really important way of understanding why the scientific consensus is so robust is because of just how many independent lines of evidence from different systems, whether it's biological systems like birds or plants or physical systems like the um, heat content or the acidity of the oceans, they all point in the same direction, almost overwhelmingly. There are some data sets that are outliers, but the vast majority of data sets align with the consensus around climate change. So, you know, the big point here, right, is that this isn't just about one specific computer model or just about that data that shows the increases in CO2, right? It's about all of these different ways of knowing and generating knowledge. And that's what scientists are drawing upon when they come to the conclusion that we have an urgent problem on our hands that needs action. So just to wrap this up, climate scientists think of climate change and the earth climate system is a puzzle, right? There are a lot of pieces of this puzzle. They've got enough of this puzzle put together that they can you know, have confidence in this um, uh, scientific consensus. I mean, not all the pieces are there. There's some holes in the puzzle still, a couple of pieces they can't quite fit together yet. But it's a very different way of thinking than most climate skeptics. And we still hear a lot of uh, from climate skeptics, especially on the, in, kind of in the conservative context of American politics. And climate skeptics view climate science really as a house of cards, where if there's one piece of evidence that doesn't quite fit, right, if you could just pull that out, right, this entire house of cards is gonna come tumbling down, right? And they've been trying to find that one piece of evidence to make this house of cards fall down, and it hasn't worked, right? Whereas climate scientists, you know, they've got enough of the puzzle in place that they know how all of this fits together even if they don't have every last piece um, in it. Okay, so that was a little orientation to just climate science basics. So climate scientists, you know, they got the big puzzle, but there are pieces that they're trying to figure out. There are uncertainties, and we should emphasize that there's a lot that we don't know about exactly how the Earth climate system is going to change in the future. And so just to highlight a few uncertainties. One is we know that we're gonna see increases in things like temperature. And so what this graph shows is the distribution of temperature and what it might look like on the left if the distribution stays the same, right, and the mean temperature just goes up, say by a degree Celsius or two degrees Celsius. And the big uncertainty here is we're not sure 
how the distribution is going to change of things like temperature and storm events and droughts as we go into the future. It's very possible that it won't just be the average that changes, but it'll actually be the distribution of these events. And that's what's shown on the right side, right? And if the distribution changes as well as the average temperature, or the average number of storm events, or the intensity of those storms, you could have much more frequent extreme events. Um, and here it's showing much more frequent extreme heat waves with that increase in mean. And so that's a big uncertainty. We're not sure to what extent we're going to see a change in distribution or just a shift in terms of the mean. And scientists are trying to figure that out. Another big uncertainty is that when we look for how climate's impacting Earth, a lot of the changes are very slow and they're very incremental, right? We're talking about millimeters of increase in sea level rise each year or tenths of a degree of temperature each year, right? These are things that are linear and they're relatively slow, they're speeding up, but they're incremental, right? And those are changes that are relatively easy to manage. But one question we need to be asking is when might we hit a tipping point, right? When might there be a change that's not incremental and linear, but a nonlinear jump in the system, right? And so I've been teaching climate for roughly 15 years now. When I started teaching, the idea that we were going to see major changes in the Arctic, that seemed like the sort of thing we were talking about next century. But one of the most really stunning changes has been how quickly we have lost ice in the Arctic. And so what this map shows us is the yellow line is the median edge of um, Arctic sea ice at kind of the peak and when you have the most ice in March, uh, March or so of each year. And you can, before it starts to melt with the spring and the summer. And what you can see is that in, I guess I didn't put the date up there, but this is data from 2019. When we reached the minimum sea ice, it was significantly smaller than what the median ice edge had been from 1981 to 2010. And actually, I just misspoke. So that yellow line is the median minimum sea ice at the end of summer. Why this is important, right, is that there's a lot less ice now in the Arctic at the end of the melt season than there had been on average in the past. And the reason that matters is that the Arctic is, it's an ocean, right? There's not much land, right? If all that ice goes away, all you're left with is the Arctic Ocean, right? If you have ocean water that's exposed to sunlight, it will absorb about 80 or 90% of the sunlight that is incident upon it, right? That is a very different state than what we have right now, where the Arctic is largely covered with ice. Ice is like a mirror, right? That sunlight comes down and it bounces back out to space, right? So most of that radiation, about 80 to 90%, is not absorbed, right? So if you lose all of the Arctic sea ice, it's like flipping a switch from a system that reflects the radiation to one that absorbs it. And what I didn't think 15 years ago was that you all might see that in your lifetimes. But I think we may be seeing this in the next 20, 30 years at the rate of change. And that's going to be a nonlinear shift where suddenly things are going to change a lot faster than we thought that they could. But exactly when that's going to happen, is it going to be 20 or 30 years or is it going to be 60 or 70 years or is it still going to be in the, uh, in the next century? Those are things that are hard to predict. There are uncertainties um, that we can't quite be sure of, but it's a risk that needs to be managed. So that's a big question. When, when, when might we see these kinds of irreversible nonlinear shifts in the climate system? And then the last big uncertainty is one that scientists can't be responsible for. The last uncertainty is what are we going to do? What are people going to do? How are we going to change our systems, our development paths, our commitments? Are we going to take strong action? Are we going to you know, make strong statements and divest? Are we going to shift to net zero technologies as quickly as we can? And what this map shows are all the different paths that the IPCC models for how humans may behave, right? The ones that are red are the ones where we take the least action. The ones that are blue 
or where we take the strongest action that we can. So just to sum up, you know, I'm kind of move back from the uncertainties and think about what it looks like going out into the future if we don't take action. So based on current climate commitments, what countries around the world have said they will do, we're talking about average global temperatures at this point that are headed towards 3.4 degrees Celsius warming on average, right? Just over six degrees Celsius Fahrenheit by the end of the 21st century, that would contribute to about a meter of sea level rise by the end of the 21st century. So that's kind of based on current commitments um, going forward, which is scary. So I know you all do a lot of work as part of Albright. And then if you're looking for resources on climate change and the state of the knowledge around the earth climate system and what things look like going out into the future, um, here are some really good resources that you can draw upon. You all will have my slides. So you all can come back and find this if you're looking for it. Okay, so that was a lot about data and graphs and science and you know, ultimately, we're concerned about this because of the ways it's going to affect people and ecosystems and the people who depend upon the ecosystems uh, going into the future. And you know, so I want to kind of take some time to think about the ethical and justice dimensions of climate change, because this is um, an area, you know, just the ways in which we talk about climate have changed significantly over the last 15 years. And I think the reframing in terms of climate justice has been the most important way in which we have reframed discussions around climate change, where this is front and center um, in terms of thinking about reasons for action. And so climate justice is kind of the framework for thinking about this, right? The realization that those who are most exposed to the consequences of climate change, right, are the ones who are least responsible for it, right? And these are overwhelmingly the poor, people of color, indigenous communities, both in developed countries and in developing countries. And there are a couple of different axes to climate justice, right? One is about the distribution of environmental harm. Right? And so we know that these groups of people are disproportionately exposed to the consequences of a changing climate. Right? So whether we're talking about hurricanes like Harvey or Sandy or Katrina, right? the evidence shows that those who've been on the front lines who've suffered most greatly been least able to adapt have been justice communities. Um, this is a picture of President Nasheed, who is, I believe is the president of Mauritius, so that suddenly my memory is slipping on that, but signing a statement protesting the inaction on climate change in scuba gear, right, to symbolize where his low-lying island state nation is headed uh, if we don't take stronger action on climate change. Um, but, you know, one important central component is just exposure to climate harms, right? That's a key part of climate justice. But another part is the ways in which we've caused climate change, right, has been about burning fossil fuels. And extracting fossil fuels also disproportionately affects environmental justice communities, people of color, poor communities. And so, you know, issues like the tar sands pipeline protests or protesting Shell and other petroleum companies' activities in Agoni land in Nigeria or Chevron's activities in, in Ecuador, all of this fits in the context of climate justice as well, right? It's not just about the consequences of climate change to come, but the ways in which both historically and today we extract fossil fuels in ways that jeopardize people's health with a disproportionate impact on environmental justice communities. So there's a distributional kind of component to this. The other component to climate justice is a procedural one, right, an issue of procedural justice, ensuring that these communities are at the table, that their voices are heard in international negotiations. And there's a lot of work to be done to, in the international community to ensure that happens going forward. 
Um, although, you know, thinking about where we were 15 years ago in terms of engaging this, these issues and um, the ways in which um, the global south, small island nation states have organized around climate change, there's also, uh, you know, the agency and success in putting these, is these issues on the, um, on the front burner. It's, it's been really important. I mean, I think their work is why we talk about this differently today than we were a decade ago. If you're thinking about issues of climate justice and your work is part of Albright, a uh, really useful resource is the work that they do with the Notre Dame Global Adapt Adaptation Program. They have an index where they draw on socioeconomic data and integrate it for countries around the world to assess what um, vulnerability looks like to climate change based on economy, agriculture, um, GDP, uh, health resources, and you know, as you can see, right, the sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, um, small island nation states, these are the ones that are red that are in kind of worse off in terms of their ability to adapt and be prepared for climate change. And you know, if you take another map, right, which is who's most responsible for climate change, right, who is emitting the most greenhouse gases, right, I mean, as you all already know, it's an inverse, right, of the map of who's most vulnerable and least able to manage this, right? So these two maps, really capture kind of the heart of climate justice. So take a couple of more minutes and set this in a US context and the context of US environmental politics that is kind of my area of specialty. The book that Grace mentioned, The Republican Reversal, was about Republicans and how they have reversed themselves on environmental policies. So I've thought a lot and um, watched really carefully um, events over the last three years. And so talk a little bit about Trump and the Paris Accord, but just to set this up and just to emphasize, right, whether Trump was in office or not, right, addressing climate change is a really hard problem, both in the US and around the world. And in the US, it's just important to realize that the system that we need to dismantle in the next 30 years, the energy system, right, is, is massive, right? And the transition to using fossil fuels in the 20th century was extraordinary, right? So if you go back to, you know, before the Civil War in the US, right, we didn't burn fossil fuels, right? We were relying on wood almost entirely for energy in this country, for heating and firing boilers and that sort of thing. But, you know, the rise of coal and then the rise of petroleum and natural gas fundamentally changed the composition of energy consumption, right, in ways that have driven climate change, but also allowed us to build a society that, you know, rests on uh, a foundation of fossil fuels. So this is a share of energy consumption uh, during the 20th century, um, but this is also the magnitude of energy consumption, right? And so just the amount of energy and how quickly it grew in the 20th century is central to this as well. And you can see how important petroleum, natural gas, and coal were to this. So, you know, it's hard to solve, right, because we rely and are so dependent on fossil fuels. That's kind of the material, kind of foundation of this. It is a hard issue to solve for some broader conceptual reasons as well. And one of those is this is a classic instance of the tragedy of the commons, right? where burning fossil fuels benefits each of us, right, individually, right? But the consequences of doing so, right, are distributed much more broadly. Not evenly, right, we talked about justice issues, but spread much more broadly. So remembering, you know, that this is an example of that tragedy of the commons is important in thinking about the challenge. Another, as you all are well aware, is that this is an intergenerational challenge, right? the last three years, the level of mo mobilization amongst you all around this issue has changed the conversation, right? Democratic debate Tuesday night, Bernie Sanders highlighting the Sunrise Movement, right? Which did not exist two years ago, but it is all about youth activists raising their voices on climate change and pushing for things like the Green New Deal, right? It, you know, makes clear that this is an intergenerational issue where, you know, your generation is making their voice heard but the real, I mean, as much as you all are going to be affected by this, right, it is the future generations who are not yet born who are going to be most affected. 
So thinking about this in terms of an intergenerational challenge. And then last, you know, this is an issue of externalities where there are lots of economic transactions that incur a cost that's not priced into the exchange, right? So when you buy gasoline, right, you are not paying for the social costs of that gasoline. And that is a central challenge. How do we um, deal with this problem of externalities in the context of climate change? So thinking about why climate is hard to solve, right? It's not just the importance of fossil fuels, but these larger conceptual frameworks that help us understand why this is so hard to solve as well. And it's hard to solve, and we actually, we've been trying to solve it for a really long time, right? So I think that's one other useful piece of information. I think at some level you all probably all heard about the Paris Climate Accord and how important that was as kind of a breakthrough moment in 2015. But the path to the Paris Climate Accord started back in 1992, when the world really first started to own up to the threat of climate change. And so in 1992, the United Nations passed this framework convention on climate change. And just want to highlight one thing, one objective that it um, set forth, which is, was that the world would take action to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. That was the goal in 1992. Now, this, I just kind of highlight some politics here. It's President uh, George H.W. Bush, who actually led the charge on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, right? So a Republican president who was pushing for action on this on the heels of the Republican Reagan administration, which had pushed hard to take action on the ozone hole, right? So I'm mentioning this kind of as a measure of how much our politics have changed in the last 30 some years. Um, and actually, President George H.W. Bush, his um, chief negotiator on this was Bill Riley, who was actually here for Albright about a year ago, um, last January, and we had a conversation about politics and um, international efforts to address climate change, which was really interesting. So that United Nations framework, preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference in climate change, it set up a framework for negotiations. And the problem is, ever since, we've been negotiating about how actually to take action on climate change. And so you all have heard about Paris, right, down here at the bottom. But there are all these other meetings that happened before Paris to try and get us to an agreement. And so Paris was a breakthrough moment because there are a couple of big things that were on the table for the first time. One of them was actually giving meaning to what dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system meant. And on the table was saying, well, what that actually means in practice is a 1.5 Celsius increase in temperature. That, if we go beyond that, right, then it's dangerous. So that was on the table. Another thing that was important to Paris was that this was the first time that both developed and developing countries, kind of the entire world, were coming to the table to take action together. Before that, it had always been, you know, if countries like the United States and the European Union, they need to take action first. And there are good reasons for that. And then the rest of the world would come on later. But in Paris, okay, what was on the table is we can't wait for that. We all need to be taking action now. And then uh, on the table in Paris was verifying and inventorying emissions from developed countries, which had not been taking place uh, kind of at an official level before that. So those are the things that were on the table. The reason Paris was so important was because so much of that was accomplished. They settled on a target of two degrees Celsius with kind of the ideal being one and a half degrees Celsius. They did get commitments from developing and developed countries to work in tandem towards goals. But the key part of Paris is that it wasn't binding. It allows every country to set their own targets and the flexibility to meet those targets in ways that work best for that particular country. And we can talk more about this. That's, you know, there are good reasons that it was put together that way. Um, but this pledge and review approach has been really important to the Paris Accord. Uh, 
so it had a lot of flexibility, but in terms of politics, right, there was great kind of symbolic weight in having the U.S. pull out of the Paris Climate Accord because the Obama administration had played a key role in putting it into place. So in his first year in office, President Trump went to the Rose Garden in June of 2017 and gave kind of one of his three major addresses on the environment. This is the first one, and he pulled the United States out of the Paris Climate Accord. He set that motion, uh, process in motion. It takes three years to actually get out of the accord. There's a three-year waiting period, so we can't pull out until November of 2020. But how did he explain this? And how he explained it was interesting because he actually did not talk about climate science at all. He didn't raise arguments that it's the sun or kind of raise kind of skeptical considerations. He didn't focus on the science. Instead, he really anchored it in, in values, that it was about the economy. It was about American exceptionalism and autonomy and, and about the free market. So he argued that one, that this favored developing countries like China and India. It still went too hard on the United States relative to other growing countries. And so he didn't like it for that reason. Another reason is it was in his assessment that the initial commitments weren't gonna make any difference, that they weren't big enough, uh, which is all, that was true, but the goal was to make more and more commitments as we went forward. So everybody expected that you know, the initial commitments would be, not be um, sufficient. They were not in, inconsequential though. Um, and three, he argued that the free market was the best way to solve this problem, right? That any kind of regulation, whether it was at the national level, or at the international level, you know, that was going to stifle the kind of innovation that we need to address climate change. So Trump has him saying it's inconsequential. It's going to make a tiny, tiny difference. Um, he set us in motion to pull out of the Paris Accord just before the election um, this year. So there we go. Four topics, kind of some basic orientation to the science and a little bit about the politics. The climate's a really, it's a really important topic. It's a really um, uh, complicated topic. It's, it's intersectional, right, in all of its dimensions. So let me pause here. Let you all take, say, three or four minutes and just chat with those who are around you. Look at the handout that I sent around. And what we can do is I can talk about any one of those topics. I'm curious to hear your take on any one of those topics. Um, so we can talk about A, B, C, D, E, e F, or G, or H. Um, or if you all just have questions, I'm also happy to answer questions. But first step, take three minutes, talk amongst yourselves, and then we'll take it from there. All right? All right, I'm starting to see hands. Sorry to interrupt all the conversations, but let's bring it back together. So why don't we start here? Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Kenza, and Sophia and I were uh, thinking uh, about topic B. Is climate politics fundamentally about corporate power and special interests, or is there more to the story? What do you think? <laughs> I'm biased. And I would say that uh, there's a lot about corporate power and the money because they're also uh, influencing a lot the way uh, governments function uh -huh. and uh, companies have more power than certain countries. Yeah. And graphs like this certainly kind of speak to that, right? You know, this is from the Center for Responsive Politics and it shows where money from these energy industries have gone, right, and largely to Republicans who uh, don't favor addressing climate change. So that would speak to, Kenza, to your, your point. Other, uh, other quick comments on, on this topic, and we'll go into it in some more. Yeah, in the back row. Um, also, another thing is there's a lot of multinationals who go to other countries, mm -hmm. and I think something that um, we found out about is that in Mozambique, for example, they were moving people into different areas so that they could mine in like this one area, but the areas that were moving them to made them a lot less prepared mm -hmm. um, for the disasters um, that were going to happen, like the drought, the El Nino drought and the El Nino floods. And so that's the thing where the corporate interests then also increase the consequences sure. mm -hmm. that a lot of these um, marginalized people. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. One more thought and then I'll add yeah. something. Um, I mean, Trump kind of corroborates this. He says that free markets are like going to like help 
we're going to help um, sort of mitigate the climate problem. He's essentially saying that these are the companies or these are the, I, the people who are going to fix the issue when these are also the same companies that are causing a, a huge responsibility for those issues. So we see that like he's even like playing into their, um, like their what these companies would say in response to any sort of policy that would like stop them from doing stuff like that, what they did in Mozambique, yeah. Yeah, these are all really interesting observations. And I, just, I want to take a couple of minutes to add in a little bit of context because I think kind of first order, absolutely, right? There's no question that, you know, fossil fuel money, corporate interests have played a key role in kind of outcomes like the one you're talking about in Mozambique, it sounds like, but also in terms of politics and the policies that we've adopted, right? Um, you can follow the money. Um, you can follow efforts to confuse the public and the kinds of money that have gone into climate disinformation campaigns. And it's very clear that the fossil fuel industries had a strong role in funding the activities of um, groups like the Heartland Institute, um, which has done a lot to, uh, for these kinds of misinformation campaigns. Uh, there's a study that was done on this by Justin Farrell at, at Yale, which you know, tried to look at the connections. If you look at, in, um, at the rhetoric of different climate groups and how they connect to fossil fuels, and he did what's called a discourse analysis. And just to kind of really briefly mention this, you know, he looked at all of these different groups that work on climate and the ones that were skeptical. And the green clusters are those that clustered clo um, closest to the Koch Foundation. And so he demonstrated kind of these rhetorical ties that really kind of all concentrated around where the money was coming from, right? And kind of outcomes that you were, would expect, but it's a really interesting quantitative analysis of this. And I think if you go to a climate rally, I mean, this is one of the first points that you hear if you go to the Sunrise Movement, is that it's the big moneyed interests like the Koch brothers. They're the reason we haven't take action on climate change, right? And so I'm a college professor. My job is to complicate these kinds of narratives. And one of the things that I've really come to appreciate in researching my book on the Republican reversal is how this is an important part of the story, but it is by no means the whole story, and I think we really need to own up to the fact that it's not just about the money. This is about a lot about culture um, and people's values as well. And so I think one of the things that stands out to me about President Trump and his administration is just how effectively he's made anti-environmentalism environmentalism kind of a populist cause amongst his base. And, you know, one way that you can kind of take measure of this is to look at the polling data in terms of who thinks global warming is a problem, that it's caused by human activities, right? And so on this graph, people who think that it's a problem that we need to take action, right, they're in green, right? And those who don't are those that show up in blue. And right, and this looks like the red state, blue state, kind of coastal um, heartland kind of map that you would expect. But let's think about what's behind this, because I don't think it's just fossil fuel money that's behind this. And one thing that really kind of brought this home for me is when I was doing research on the book was listening to the testimony of coal miners who are the ones who are going to lose their jobs, right, when we make this transition to a clean energy future. And you know, when you listen to people like Walter Parker, who is a coal miner in Alabama from a coal town, he's not talking about big fossil fuel money, he's talking about his ability to provide for his family. He's talking about his ability to have the hometown that he grew up in, you know, that, it is, that is his place, um, you know, to do the work that he does. I and mean, it's about his, really, it's a lot about um, gender here and um, providing that, you know, he was talking about when he gave his testimony and when he gave it, he was tearful. You know, he was so afraid about the change that was to come. And I think for a lot of people, right, it's about their work and their ability to provide for the families. I think for others, it's um, you know about kind of their sense of freedom and autonomy and their ability to drive where they want to go and to buy gasoline at low prices to do that. And they care about that freedom and those values. And those things are really important to understanding the opposition because um, I think those are things that get talked a lot about in these communities that are opposed to change that are in the center of the country. Another important kind of cultural dimension of opposition to climate change is actually rooted in the religious right. 
And there's a study here from the Political Research Quarterly that looked at uh, religious groups that are focused on end times theology, right? That Christ is going to return, that um, we're gonna see an end times and in human lives. And you know, not surprisingly, people who believe this are, do not think that we need to take action on climate change, right? The Christian right's a very complicated um, movement, right? There are definitely groups on the Christian right that are very much in favor of action on environment and climate, but there's also a large wing, groups that are associated with end times theology that don't think we need to take action, who think that it's actually the devil's work to kind of draw us in the, into the notion that people could be changing Earth's climate. And realizing that you know, th that is about cultural beliefs, it is about religion, it's about people's values, that informs why some people are opposed to action on climate change, which is not disconnected from some of that fossil fuel money, but it's also a far, it's a, a long distance from it. And so I think understanding and acknowledging that conservative opposition to climate change isn't just about the money, it's about a lot of values that are really central to conservative politics in the US notions of American exceptionalism, opposition to international governance, you know, the support for the free market enterprise, a real faith that kind of plenty and abundance is what humans are meant to realize, that that's kind of why we are on this planet, and that's part of this evangelical faith in God's creation. All of those are important to why there's so much controversy around climate change. So I think there's you know, a lot to be said about the cultural dimensions of this. Um, so there's a couple of thoughts on that from me. Anybody want to piggyback on that and then maybe we can move to another topic here in a, a second in the back row? Like, I have a question or like an opinion and also a question too in this sense. So even like I understand the point between like difference between Republican and Democrats like in the US and like perception of their free market. But even when we look at more on the Democratic side of the US, like let's say pick two big economics, one of them being Nicholas Stern, that like released this report saying mm -hmm. that we need to cut GDP by a lot and take like more immediate actions. And then let's say uh, William Nordhaus is a Yale economist mm -hmm. who took the same facts and said that we don't need to take as serious actions and won the Nobel Prize like last year. And or like even last year, like when Al Gore came to talk in Wellesley, and one of the students asked him, oh, like do you think that the problem like at the heart of this like issue is just capitalism or consumerist culture and his answer was things were not great in the Soviet Union. So like I feel like when we talk about free market even on the most like left side on the US there's a still a huge belief in free market and growth that is measured in GDP terms mm -hmm. and that like no one can make even like really really serious or more um, marginal statements about what needs to be done. I mean, I'm not saying, of course, like maybe European Union say that they will take more serious actions, but they don't. But at least the perception there is that there is more to be done and more to be criticized yeah. in free market. So what do you think on, on that topic? I was wondering. Well, I, I mean, I think you're ra you know, raising a big question about whether this is about reform of kind of a system that's in place, a capitalist system, a free market system. Or I think you're alluding to the fact that maybe we need a fundamental shift in systems. And I think there are thinkers out there, right, who align themselves with what's called kind of the degrowth initiative, which you know, is about reducing GDP, rethinking what progress means, coming up with other measures. And that's a really big conversation to have. And I don't think it's one we're having fully um, enough. I mean, kind of Al Gore, right, not kind of engaging in that fully. It's a, it's a hard conversation to have, but a really good point to bring up. Yeah. Something that my group was talking about was like the impact that this was having on different countries. So taking mm -hmm. this out of the U.S. context for a little while, and yeah. I remember you said something about developing countries and how the climate and how climate change is going to have a higher effect on them. And just like being from Nigeria, got me mm -hmm. thinking: some developing countries don't really have the power to say no to these big corporations that are coming in to like burn also the mm -hmm. fuels and like take resources from the countries and they don't have the power to say no and but they're also going to be the ones to suffer like the most consequences so in a graph like the one you show that shows the contributions that all of these 
um, companies are giving these different political parties. I was just wondering if there was any research done on how, like, the influence that these companies, same companies, are having on different countries outside of the U.S. Yeah, good, good question. I yes, I mean there is certainly research done on that, right? And the role of kind of in connections between international aid and resource extraction. I mean those are really important topics, right? Because there is this history of extractive industry and development and taking fossil fuels out, right? And moving them to other places. I mean, Nigeria is a case in point of this, right? With, um, with, with petroleum. Um, but I think, you know, the other, I'm gonna turn this a different way. I think when you look at what's been happening around the world, I mean, some of the countries that have made the greatest drives towards, a, you know, moving towards a clean energy economy are, you know, not the European Union or certainly not the United States, but it is developing countries, right? You know, countries like Costa Rica um, or Kenya, where, you know, they've been able, because they haven't been locked into the same fossil fuel infrastructure, they've been had more freedom and been able to move towards renewable energy sources much more quickly. And so I think, you know, it, this is a really interesting moment in terms of kind of money and resources and uh, the role of the energy industry because the renewable energy sector has been growing so quickly. There's so much money moving into it that I think, I guess, it, it's not clear to me that, you know, those companies aren't going to be, you know, equally kind of influential going forwards in shaping the development paths of countries. And I think we, you know, and we need to scrutinize that, right? We know kind of when big corporations have come in um, and been tangled up in aid projects, that has not always been a good outcome, right? And lots of examples of that on the fossil fuel side. But you know, we shouldn't just assume that renewable energy, right, is going to have some better outcome, right, when it goes into developing countries. So, you know, thinking about that carefully seems really important, too. Yeah. yeah. So you've also been talking a little bit about, um, like, the, like, the power of data and science to politicians and like, how to have, so, like, we were, we've, been, we've been, like, at least I was, like, really confused, like, puzzled by why is somebody who is not talking about data and science being able to convince so much, so many people, and, like, why is, why, like, why we, like, we see, like, this is true and this is proved by science, but, yeah, like, people aren't acting on it, and like we were, we were saying like, well, yes, there's like the economy development, there's the, um, the, the national autonomy mm -hmm. thing, and like there's job loss, there's corporate power, and like money, campaign, and, uh, and it's just like the, the tragedy of the commons. And so I wonder what, I'm curious, like what narratives has, have been the most convincing to politicians, and like what has spoken to, yeah. to them in their language? Yeah, so what narratives have, been most important in kind of mobilizing action or in some cases in action around climate change. I mean, I, so when you all think about it, I mean, what are the ways that kind of climate has often been framed? I mean, what, are, what are kind of the narratives that come to your minds? I've got some thoughts on this. Curious to hear what other folks have to say too. What narratives? Like one's the polar bear, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. So somebody want to spin that one out for me a little bit? Like what's climate change look like in, in, in that sense? Grace? I think like the ice caps are melting and polar bears are being displaced mm -hmm. and then they are like, it's like, that it's like a hearts and minds thing kind of, but like for the polar bears, like they're, they're stranded or they're dying or they're going to like sort of wander down and, you know, you have to integrate in our society, like lots of funny cartoons <laughs> about that. Mm -hmm. um, and like why we should care is because of polar bears and not because of anything else. Yeah. So that's important. Other narratives that stand out? Yeah. I think one narrative that I hear a lot is like people who are pushing climate, like they're going to take a round meat we won't be able to, like people who are pushing for climate action, we won't be able to have meat anymore. Yeah. How much the industry is contributing. Right. I mean, people are less interested in talking about like transforming the economy, right? You know, like, but like what's really radical is the idea that you might take away meat, right? Especially in the United States. Yeah. But speaking of that, there's this um, emphasis on individual action and like, oh, that's the reason why we're having this problem. Mm -hmm. But like, what about the individual action? 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 Like, what about the individual
perpetuates, yeah, the status quo. Now that's great. I mean, so these are really useful ways to think about these narratives that have been really important to um, shaping how we think about climate, right? You know, it's just about polar bears and the Arctic, right? It's not about, um, you know, small island nation states and their viability and the people who depend upon them, right? It's, you know, if we're gonna take action, well, it should be individuals who take action, right? That's the real root, right? You should feel guilty for the things you could do when we know this is a systemic issue where you know, we need to have corporate reform and economic reform to deal with this. Um, and, you know, so these are important narratives that play in here, but your question was like, what narratives might work, right? And I think one narrative that hasn't gotten as much attention, but is starting to emerge is, that you know this isn't about future generations right actions to address climate change have immediate public health impacts right historically right if you want to mobilize action around environmental issues the public health framework has been kind of the strongest kind of plank you can build upon right so one of the success stories i mentioned was lead Right? It took a while, but once we realized the harms and started taking um, regulatory reform actions on lead, the changes were substantial and they were swift. And I think one of the reframings that we're starting to see is really emphasizing the public health dimensions of climate change. Right? Curbing fossil fuel emissions isn't just about greenhouse gas emissions, it's also about particulate matter, which has immediate impacts on the health of all of us, but especially of children. Right? There's new research that shows, and I learned this from my students in ES-102 last semester, that as carbon dioxide levels rise in the atmosphere, the nutritional quality of staple crops drops, right? Which is really troubling in a world where we're gonna have more people. We need to have more nutritious calories to go around, right? And so if more CO2 means less nutritious crops, right? That's part of a public health argument for dealing with this in the near term. And I think, you know, this is a sort of emphasis that's not about polar bears, right? It's about the health of children and it's about the health of children now that begins to reframe the issue. And so I think, you know, in terms of kind of um, where I've seen, you know, the kind of most possibility, like that narrative um, really seems important. But it's one that's still emerging. And in part, it's emerging because we're still realizing that the polar bear framework doesn't work. I think we're pretty far past that at this point, but we haven't quite figured out what, I mean, obviously we haven't figured out what does work, but public health seems to be, you know, really have a, a lot of potential. Well, lots of hands. Um, and I think I saw yours first. Um, just to kind of follow up, yeah. with, um, thinking about public health and health and framing the conversation, that narrative, how do we make sure when we do that, we're including all people and not simply kind of the communities that reflect most who's in power. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about things like mm -hmm. the lead crisis and, and that sort of public area, um, I suppose, how do we make sure that it's not just communities that are white and upper class, um, but are actively looking for solutions that are intersectional um, and inclusive? Mm -hmm. It's an important question. Thoughts on that? Yeah. So I have a question that's kind of connected to that, but I think that all of the narratives that we talked about that are most successful or popular all have the common denominator that it only, they become successful once they're focusing on the victim becoming somebody who, you know, necessarily is the perpetrator. When we talk about public health, what is public health? Mm -hmm. When already there's been so many disadvantaged communities and countries as a whole that have been, their health, their public health yeah. has been harmed and that public health only becomes relevant when it becomes I guess the the very privileged and hegemonic identity becomes impacted and hurt from those public health perceptions. So I guess I'll, going off of that, how can something where people in, with privilege, whether that be individual people and nations and <coughs> systems of colonialism and imperialism as a whole, ever become something that is able to be mobilized to actually lead to inclusive and intersectional um, climate change efforts. Yeah. I think, I think, um, just to touch upon that, this goes back to the whole what is in it for me. And I think for people to be able to take action, just like you mentioned, there has to be something in it for them. There has to be a real threat to them. A big, good, great example of this is the Ebola crisis in 2014. Mm -hmm. It was already going on in West Africa. People were dying, but like no one actually cared about it. So it became a threat to the US. I mean, two months of vaccine was like 
people, Johnson and Johnson made something, like they acted upon it. So I feel like if the narrative can be shaped in such a way, and it's sad, it's sad that there's a lack of empathy, but if the narrative can be shaped in such a way that there is a threat, like an active mm -hmm. threat to the perpetrators of um, climate change, if there is like an economic disadvantage for these big corporations and they keep doing what they're doing, or maybe there is like a health challenge for people who live in like bougie areas who may seem like this is not my problem, but if there is a real health threat to them, then <laughs> believe it, climate change will be solved. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a very realistic take, right? But it's not good enough for the question that Anne is asking. Right? We want a more inclusive approach. And, and so, you know, our generation hasn't done that, right? So you all are going to have to help us get there. So is there a totally different topic on the sheet that anybody's interested in going to? Um, how about over here? Yeah. It's not on the sheet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, hi, I'm Zara. I don't know if you remember me. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Nice to see you. <laughs> so I'm Econ and ES, and one of the things, and, and those come to heads very often. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, I'm not like encouraging this, but I'm interested in your thoughts on the sort of rise in trying to invest in nuclear energies again. No. People are finding, they're trying to find ways to make it um, more economically feasible than green energies like wind power and solar power, and it's also taking up less space than wind power and solar power. Yeah. But there's still these major risks if something goes wrong. Chernobyl. Um, and so, <laughs> like, just what are your takes on that as it is on the rise? And the other alternative energy, um, hydroelectric um, energies, and like trying to access that, even though it's not, it is expensive and it's uh, not as consistent mm -hmm. with energy flow. So, like, what are your takes on the rise of alternative energies? Yeah. Quick poll How many folks think nu nuclear might be part of the solution here? Got some hands? Okay. Yeah, just curious. Um, I mean, I think, you know, for many environmentalists, a knee jerk reaction is no, right? It's not part of the solution. It's maybe carbon free, but it's by no means sustainable. I mean, you couldn't be handing down to a future generation any bigger problem than the waste problem that um, comes with nuclear technology. Uh, one of my students in my capstone seminar on uh, in environmental studies, um, Isabella, I guess, what was it, two years ago, this was her beat for her capstone project. She reported on the nuclear technology and how it was changing. And you know, there's another generation of technology that's out there that's very different from what was put into place in the post-World War II era, right? which is there it was enormous um, nuclear reactors. And the new technology is much smaller scale. And in theory, right, um, potentially safer, more manageable, right? All the things that engineers tell you about new products, right? Um, but but it is, is different. And at least from my perspective, big picture, thinking about, you know, if we get to where those projections say we might get to in 2100, right? A meter sea level rise, right? You know, it's not just about a meter of sea level rise, but how much more water gets pushed in with each storm, right? How much more salinization there is. I mean, the consequences of that for people, right? People who are not ready for that around the world are so grave. I'm not willing to take anything off of the table right now. I think we need to consider all options. And if that means nuclear power might be part of the mix for a period of time, I think that's something we need to put research money into, support the studies, support the safety assessments, and see where it goes. I think hydro, you know, is one point that we can make. And this gets to, I'm going to get to one of the points in my slides, that last one. What's the matter with the Green New Deal, right? Well, the matter, and there's kind of a double play there, right? the matter is the stuff that we're going to need to build, that clean energy future that we want to get to. Every source of energy imposes some costs, right? And so if you're thinking about where the Green New Deal is going to take us, right, which is to 100% renewable energy future with net zero emissions by 2050, like we need to get there. But we also need to acknowledge that getting there is going to mean building a lot of windmills, right? Putting up a lot of solar panels, building more dams. And just the scale of materials that it is going to take to do that is orders of magnitude, well, not orders of magnitude, but significantly greater than what we're extracting now. And we know that just like extracting fossil fuels impose costs, so does making concrete and copper and cobalt, right? We've been hearing about the Democratic uh, Republic of the Congo and child labor and cobalt, which is important to the batteries and all of our phones and laptops. You know, there are real costs to extraction. So you know, we need to acknowledge that we're 
we have hard decisions to make, right? There's no easy path to a sustainable future. And you know, in the rush to embrace carbon-free technologies, we can't forget about the costs that are going to be imposed by, you know, that are going to come with these renewable energy technologies too, and we need to plan for them. So in that context, right, I want to think carefully about all of these options. So that's kind of my take. So where else are we? Katie. Hi, I'm wondering actually if you can talk about these. Um, and so what steps has wealthy taken so far to address climate justice and climate change? And what else can we do? And what in particular can the wealthy community do to make sure that we are holding Wellesley accountable for its carbon footprint and making sure that the college pursues socially responsible um, climate-based policy? Well, I know you've got a lot to say about that. Um, I have an agenda to ask them this question. <laughs> so uh, let me just, I'll try and be, I know we only have five minutes left, so I'll be uber quick and then we can get some comments on this point. So we have a big footprint, right? All the things we do, right, generates carbon, right? You put all of that together, it adds up to about 32,600 <laughs> metric tons of carbon, which you divide that among our 2,000 people or 2,400 students, right? That's just a lot of carbon that's being added to the atmosphere, more than our fair share by far. So what is the college planning on doing? Well, that's where we were in 2010. And the college has done stuff. Um, and we've got goals, right? We're planning to reduce emissions by 37% by 2026, 44% by 2036, and then take some planning to get towards the big goal, which is net zero sometime in the future. So I just kind of marked there on the left side, these are the goals going forward. And the college has taken steps. We have made our buildings more efficient and that's reduced energy consumption. We've got plans for energy efficiency projects going forward and a really big project is reworking our power plant, which is gonna happen over the course of the next three years. But you put all of the things that the college is committed to doing and it gets us on track to meet that initial goal, 2026 goal, early, which is exciting because that's a big decline, right? It's hard to do these things. So I think there are some things that are going in the right direction. But a big question is how we get from there to that long-term goal, which should be a nearer-term goal, right, um, of net zero emissions. And the big question is how to deal with two things, right? One is we're going to start buying electricity off of the grid instead of burning natural gas here at the college to make our electricity. That's a really good thing. That we're going to start buying electricity. Um, the other is, as you all know, we live in old buildings, right? You all live in old buildings. I just come and work in old buildings. I'm, I know it's harder on you all than it is on me. But how you heat and cool those buildings is really hard uh, in terms of kind of dealing with this issue. So this is like the two big things we have to figure out. Where are we going to buy our energy from? And then how do we heat and cool these buildings? There's some other stuff down there. It's small potatoes compared to these big categories. And so one question is, where do we get the electricity from? You could get it from a couple of windmills or a lot of solar panels, like 200 acres of solar panels. That would give us the electricity. Um, but the big question is how we heat and cool the buildings, right? And so right now we generate steam, right? You see the steam pipes on snowy days, right? Running around campus, that's where the snow melts. That's because there's lots of heat, right? Being piped from the central power plant by the um, campus center out across campus, right? You hear the clanking of the steam in the dorms, right? That's steam that's, you know, it's like, it's like 200 and some degrees uh, Fahrenheit, between 200 and 300 getting piped around campus. The challenge is the only way to generate steam is to burn something, right? You can do nuclear, but we don't want to do that. Um, so we're going to burn something, right? And so, you know, one question is, well, could we just switch what we burn to biomass or to natural, to some kind of renewable natural gas? Right? And that would be one way to solve this problem. But to do biomass, we would need roughly 730 tractor trailers every year coming into campus to supply it. And you need about 3,000 acres of forest to provide a sustainable supply of biomass to keep our existing campus heated. Right? If everybody tried to do that, like we, literally we wouldn't have forests left in New England. Right? This isn't sustainable at scale. Renewable natural gas poses the same challenge. You can get some natural gas off of dairy farms or landfills, but if everybody tried to solve this problem by getting renewable natural gas, there wouldn't be enough to go around. So that's not a good option either. So what the college is investigating is 
transitioning away from a heating system that depends on burning something. So moving from high temperature steam to low temperature, lower temperature hot water. Because you can generate hot water using electrically powered systems. You can get that electricity from renewable energy sources. Right? So that's one big strategy is switching over to hot water heat distribution. The other strategy is drawing heat out of the ground through a geothermal system. I could talk about this in detail, but time is already running short. But the kind of upshot of this is that if you rely on geothermal, which is relying on the ground beneath us, you can use what are called heat pumps, electricity to move the heat from beneath us into our buildings. And you can power those heat pumps with solar panels and windmills and hydroelectricity and other forms of clean energy. And so moving in this direction can help us address our immediate, or address our emissions, but it's not immediate, it takes time. So that's what's being investigated right now. And it's being investigated by the E2040 committee, which the trustees and President Johnson put together and Anna is a student member of. Um, but it's, you know, E2040 is kind of the working title for this. So that's a quick snapshot of what Wellesley's doing right now. Do you wanna come in or I see a couple of other hands already popping up and I know time is running really short. Can we get like two comments and then maybe stop there? I'm a good negotiator. I'm sorry, I wish this was a comment, but um, <laughs> I've been hearing a lot about um, the investment from Wellesley mm -hmm. to fossil fuels companies and how like it's a way to keep them on your I I don't know how yeah, it works, and so that's campaign. my question. What's, what is it about colleges and universities? How, how do they use their money and how do they invest or store their money in a way that you know, works with fossil fuels companies? Yeah, so that's a big topic, right? I think like the 30 second answer and Katie could give an even better answer since she's been spearheading the divestment campaign. Would you like to do a 30 second or do you I want? Mean, we just got the numbers from the investment office. I can't explain them right now to this whole group in 30 seconds, but we can talk one on one and I can try to explain it better to you. Thank you. Yeah, but we, we have an endowment that's about $2 billion. A portion of that is invested in fossil fuels, right? The ask is for Wellesley to stop investing in fossil fuels. And it's not just colleges and universities, but the divestment campaign is targeting pension funds. It's targeting kind of many different institutional actors. Um, and it's about the symbolism, right? You know, it's a sign, right? If these institutions are pulling their money out of fossil fuels, at some point it could have material impacts on these industries as well. But I think the greater value is the symbolic value. So that's a big question and there are costs that are associated with us. So we're gonna be hearing more about the divestment campaign going forward for sure. One last one, Grace. Yeah, my question was like, so you talked about like geothermal and this hot water system that might be more sustainable, but like our buildings are super old and like the systems that are in place seem like kind of decrepit just from like yep. my perspective. Yep. Um, like, is it like realistic to think about like using these like sort of cutting edge technologies like geothermal into buildings that are really old, like Tower Court, you know what I mean? Yep. Who have been there for so long. Like, is the yeah, cost yeah. of implementing that even worth thinking about? So we're gonna have to spend a lot of money on our dormitories regardless over the next you know, decades to come. Right, so one way to do, it, do this is just to renovate them in ways that use the existing systems. Or the other way is to leverage kind of this deferred maintenance problem in ways that prepare us for the future, which would mean switching over to these new um, strategies. It will cost more, but not nearly as much as if you had just finished renovating the building and had to go back in and do it all again. And so you know, that's the hard decision that's being made because the big issue that you bring up, you framed it exactly right. Cutting edge technology, 19th century buildings, you know, it's hard to do. And really what it means fundamentally is you have to change every radiator in all of these dorms. But if we do this, it would be likely that Tower Court would be first on the list. So we'll see. There are a lot of big, a lot of big decisions to be made. Um, well, I'll stop there. Thank you all very much. Really enjoyed it. <laughs>